the whole raid was um, led by the SAS. And, and it just became like a bloodbath in, in trying to get these, these guys out the huts because in the huts as well were all the civilians. All our paras listening will be getting envious. We, we got a, a fairly high kill rate that day. Chris, how are you, brother? I'm well, I'm well. Nice to see you. Yeah, and you too. Which, which part of the world are you in at the moment? I'm uh, in Scotland. Oh, okay. So a, a bit closer to home. Or my home, I should say. As I was saying to you earlier, I, I worked in Mozambique for six months at, uh, at a street children's school. Uh, I should say post-war Mozambique because it was the place was pretty badly messed up. And the yeah. infrastructure was bar buildings and, and the water, when it did run, if you didn't have to get it from a well, that is. So it was, it was um, pretty you know, few and far between. And the... Um, my abiding memory was there were no toilets anywhere because the, when the Portuguese had pulled out, they filled the sewers with concrete. Um, if anyone's wondering why, it was because they were gutted to leave their beautiful col colony of Mozambique. And it really was like a, you know, a paradise away, a, away from home, you know, putting, putting the malaria to one side. Um, but when I did that, Chris, I did a brief course on, Africa's colonial history and you'll have to forgive me if I get stuff wrong I, 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 I do have a genuine interest but I understood that um, so it was Ian Smith wasn't it was the Prime Minister of, of Rhodesia and he declared independence from from Britain and I remember him in a speech saying that he didn't have anything against black Africans. He just reckoned if they came into rural Rhodesia, it, it would all go to, to a mess. And then, of course, we got, we got Mugabe, <laughs> which kind of proved his point. Am I sort of in the right ballpark here? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, uh, Smith, yeah, I mean, if, if the black... If the blacks had come into um, power in '65, they were not prepared for it. Um, uh, and Harold Wilson, the the British Prime Minister, in his negotiations with Smith in '66, um, had offered Rhodesia uh, as the colonial power, had offered Rhodesia um, 15 years, a transition period of 15 years, to get blacks into government and onto a franchise of basically one man, one vote. So it would have been a staggered uh, scenario. Smith um, declined, turned it down, um, and so hence stalemate. And uh, the nationalists, Mugabe um, and Nkomo, were the two primary ones, were basically opted for, the, um, for an armed struggle, as they called it, yep, yep, yep. So they set up uh, the um, <clears throat> excuse me guerrilla bases in in Mozambique, sorry in in Zambia initially, um, and then um, laterally in Mozambique as the Portuguese were starting to pull out of of Mozambique. Yeah. What was it like for you, Chris, growing up in Africa? It it it, it I would think that would be quite quite the boy's life, quite exciting, you know, ch probably chasing a few snakes around and stuff like this. Yeah, it, it was, it was um, idyllic in many respects. Um, growing up a, a, a white in a colonial country, um, yeah, it was absolutely um, delightful. I mean, we really had a, a fine upbringing in the bush the whole time, that kind of stuff. Uh, it obviously didn't last, yeah. And what was the sort of connection to, to let's say, the UK or England? Were, were you, was the culture very similar? 
yeah, very similar. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we regarded the, the Queen as our Queen. Um, we were um, British, basically, um, uh, with, a, with a large South African influence. But, um, yeah, we were all intents and purposes British. I mean, our, our, um, our army, for what, what it's worth, was totally based on the British system. Training was British. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, and at what point did you decide you wanted to join the army? Um, conscription was compulsory um, for all white males and Indians and what they call colored, um, what, what we called colored, i.e. people of mixed race. It wasn't compulsory for blacks. Um, simply because uh, there, there was not the um, infrastructure to handle any large number of recruits. So <clears throat> just before I turned 18 in 1975, November 75, I received my call-up papers in, in the sort of classic little manila brown envelope um, telling me to report to Cranbourne Barracks in, in Salisbury, or Harare as it is now, on the nah, 6th of January, I think, 76. Uh, so I'd been forced to, uh, to, to being conscripted basically, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> kind of a year into my uh, conscription, um, it, it was initially 80, it was initially a one year uh, national service period, which was then very soon increased to 18 months, very soon increased to two years. Um, when they increased it to 18 months, I decided to sign on for a, a, a three-year contract, uh, a regular contract, yeah, mm -hmm. um, which took me through to early 79, yeah. And how does this time coincide with um, the sort of, what do we call them, re the rebels? The, the, were they Soviet-backed re rebels? Um <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it was, was was obviously sort of during the height of the Cold War. Um, uh, th there were two um, um, revolutionary parties, as I call them. There was um, uh, ZAPU, which was Zimbabwean African People's Union, which was Joshua and Kama, um, essentially based in Zambia, which were all um, Soviet-supplied uh, um, Russian instructors, uh, Cuban instructors as well. Um, all Soviet armament. Um, then you had uh, Robert Mugabe and his ZANU, or ZANLA, the military wing, based in um, ultimately Mozambique. They split. There, there was a fair amount of um, uh, strife between ZANU and ZAPU. They didn't get on. Um, ZAPU was essentially a Matabili tribal base, whereas um, ZANU or ZANLA, the military in Mugabe's lot, were essentially um, Mashona uh, 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 based. Um, they were the largest tribe in, in Rhodesia. Um, they were um, mainly um, red Chinese um, supported. Um, they had Chinese uh, military instructors, um, also Cuban. I mean, they, they, they took the... Uh, their supply from anywhere. I mean, they had a lot of East German um, uniforms, um, obviously all communist weaponry. Um, so yeah, they, they were, uh, they, they came across as, as kind of um, communist, but they weren't, they were more nationalists, you know, and they called each other comrade and that kind of stuff, but they were essentially nationalist based. Yeah. Gosh, so, so there's Ian Smith, he's declared independence. And now he's up against all these, let's just call them the red forces, um, people such as Mugabe fighting out of Mozambique, um, getting heavily supplied by these quite powerful nations, um, or at least what Cuba was... Um, Cuba back then was sort of a... a what can we say, a, a, a good example of how communism worked? Is, is, is it fair to say? Yeah, I'd say that, yeah. 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 
almost yep. like a bit of a sort of paradise thing going on there. I've been I've been in Cuba. It's obviously very different now after uh, Castro's reign for so many years. Um, and when when did the attacks start happening? How did the conflict initiate? It started uh, in, in 65, as soon as, in fact, it started earlier in 65 when Ian Smith de declared what was called UD UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence from, from, from Britain. Um, the nationalists, I'll call them, um, ah, the revolutionaries, started sending uh, Carters to um, the Eastern Bloc countries, um, Algeria, uh, Tanzania, uh, various countries for for military training. A lot, most of most of them went to um, to the USSR, um, and they they came back sixty uh, six and started uh, armed infiltrations of, of small groups of guerrillas uh, crossing the Zambezi River in, uh, from Zambia into uh, Rhodesia with with the the aim of attacking um, white infrastructure. Um, basically white farmers, um, economic targets, but they, they were very disorganized. Um, they, they also operated with the South African, African National Congress who were trying to get down to South Africa. Um, so they operated together. Uh, uh, that, that all came to head the, these um, incursions in 1968 with what the Rhodesians called Operation Cauldron in the Zambezi Valley, which was... Uh, the, the, the guerrillas had, had a fairly large infiltration. I say large at the time. It was probably two, 300 guerrillas had crossed the Zambezi River. And the Rhodesians, many, many with assistance from, from the Air Force with the helicopters, um, pretty well wiped them out in, in Operation Cauldron. The, the problem for the guerrillas at that time was that the Zambezi River and, and the, the territories either side of the river were pretty well uninhabited. It was wild bush, so there was there were no sort of local um, population to provide food or succor or, or water or women or you know whatever the guerrillas needed to survive. So they they had to cross this fairly, um, uh, especially in winter, uh, where the, the the water was sparse apart from the river itself. Um, they had a torrid time. Um, so at the end of 68, 69, they basically withdrew um, and there were no sort of major incursions until kind of 1970. Um, there were bits and pieces, during which time Mugabe had been, he'd been fighting with Nkoma, um, kind of like a civil war almost in Lusaka, which didn't please President Kaunda very much. Basically, Zanu got kicked out. Um, of Zambia and, and moved to Mozambique, which was still Portuguese, but they were operating out of the Tet province, which is the adjacent to Zambia and on the north northeastern border of uh, Rhodesia. Fairly large uh, piece of real estate. And by this time, the Portuguese, they, they were restricted to their base camps um, along the Zambezi River. So the the country um, the bush became effectively Folima. That, that was the Mozambican liberation movement fighting um, the Portuguese and Z uh, Zanla, Zana. So so Zanla set up uh, a lot of con a lot of uh, external camps in 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 Mozambique. The the big um, that's the real start of the what I call the war proper. I mean, it'd be very low, low key, low intensive uh, um, up until that stage. You know, there'd been several farmers murdered. Um, you know, there'd been, apart from a cauldron, there'd been a lot of minor operations, and generally the guerrillas had seen the short end of the stick. But in 1972, um, Zanla opened. I'm not sure what they called their operation, but they flooded the country with. This time, um, several hundred, if not thousands, of guerrillas. It caught the Rhodesians completely off guard um, along the northeastern um, uh, border. They, they flooded into the country and started um, fairly aggressively attacking uh, white farmers. There were a lot of casualties. And this time, um, 
they did not withdraw. And from here until 1976, um, which was when I went in, they were slowly building up their strength. And uh, the, the Rhodesians are still on top of the situation, um, uh, working in conjunction with the Portuguese. They were oper starting to operate externally into the Tet province in Mozambique, um, dealing with Frelimo and um, Zanla. But it was in 1976 that things got interesting. 1974 was a kind of watershed year for um, Southern Africa because that's when the, the so-called Carnation Revolution took place in Portugal. And overnight, um, literally, the, the, the Portuguese pulled out of their, their African colonies. That was Mozambique, Angola, um, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde. Um, <clears throat> which left a massive vacuum um, for the Rhodesians because suddenly, and suddenly for Lima, Samora Michelle, also a communist-backed, um, found themselves with a country the size of Mozambique, a massive country, um, with, with, with no expertise whatsoever in running a country. And as you say, the Portuguese pretty well sabotaged, destroyed everything they could um, when they pulled out um, I think at the time there were probably only two graduates um, in the whole of Mozambique. Um, it, would, it left a massive vacuum, and of course the Russians and the Chinese jumped in there um, in a big way. But what it did for Rhodesia, apart from um, cutting off Rhodesia's um, supply, um, all, all Rhodesia's um, uh, fuel, for example, came through... Um, Baira, the port of Baira, which is the sort of middle of Mozambique. Um, and there was a, a Royal Navy blockade um, outside Baira to stop ships coming into Baira to supply fuel and oil to the Rhodesians, all tied up with sanctions, international sanctions. But it suddenly opened up. So apart from losing that sort of fairly critical supply line, it opened up something like 1,200 kilometers of hostile border from uh, uh, down the eastern border of Rhodesia all the way down to South Africa. And uh, how the Rhodesians try to counter this, which they had been doing in the northeastern segment, was building, uh, constructing what they called a cordon sanitaire minefield that ran the whole way down the border. But it was impossible because it was fairly mountainous, rugged terrain, um, on, on the eastern side. Yeah, so that, that changed the whole complexion of the war in 1976. Um, that's when the, the final um, phase of what they called the guerrilla war started and several thousand guerrillas flooded into the country. And that was coincided when, when I went in, yeah. Yeah. When, when did Rosie, Disha, what do we say? Do we say it fail? It's, it's not... When, it, it, when, did it, when did it fall into rebel hands sort of completely? It, uh, 1980, um, April was independence. Um, the British, Lord Carrington um, and Thatcher, uh, managed to get Rhodesia to negotiate a, a settlement with uh, for, for so-called free and fair elections. Um, Mugabe pulled all his um, guerrillas back. They all went into um, assembly points, um, which were monitored by the British monitoring force. They were sent in, sent in a few dozen troops and, and policemen, actually, bobbies with the, uh, to, to, to monitor these, these camps. Um, and, yeah, the, the elections were held in, I think, early 1980. Mugabe won a landslide, and um, he came to power in 19 in April 1980, when it mm -hmm. became Zimbabwe. Yeah. God, there's so much to unpack here. So let, just going back to when you're, you're getting these in, insurgents, that must have been terrifying. I mean, essentially, you're surrounded, you know, or at least on three sides by, by rebels, who, yeah. are go, who are coming like this. And if you're a farmer who's got a farmstead on the edge here, you're going to be one of the first to 
to to to come under attack. And I've said this in in my other podcasts. It 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 wouldn't have been nice at all. Uh, we're talking a, a massacre, are, are we not? Well, yeah, but it it, it, it happened slowly. I mean, Matoko, um, which was a a farming area, a white farming area. When I say white, I mean commercial farming area. Big farms growing massive crops. Um, was a fairly um, prosperous farming area up in the northeast of the country. That was the first, one of the first to go. And by uh, by 1976-77, that whole area had been liberated. Um, uh, the, the Rhodesians could only really travel there on the roads in convoy. Um, to, to the various base camps in the area, but that was completely um, taken over by by the guerrillas. Um, same with various, you, you're right, various farming areas along the commercial farming areas along the eastern border. I'm thinking about the Burma Valley, which was just south of Mutali. Um, that was also completely um, taken over by the guerrillas. Um, when I say taken over, um, they, they didn't have their own civil um, infra, civic infrastructure, but they controlled the area. Um, so yeah, all those, all those sort of peripheral farming areas were, to, were taken over um, and they were slowly starting to um, penetrate into the, the hinterland, right into the center of the country. And I mean, so much so that in 1978, um, Zanla commandos, for, for want of a better word, um, the Rhodesians called them terrorists. They called themselves guerrillas. Um, penetrated Salisbury, the capital, now Harare, and managed to um, blow up a few department stores. But their biggest coup was when they took out the whole um, uh, Salisbury's oil supply. Uh, there, there was a massive oil depot in, in Salisbury, and they took it out. Uh, it was a fairly spectacular coup, um, so much so that Rhodesia was left with two weeks supply of fuel and if it wasn't for the South Africans and that tiny little little section of border at the bottom at Bight Bridge they basically kept Rhodesia alive um, but they used it as a the South Africans used Rhodesia as a pawn in, in their negotiations with um, what were called the black frontline states um, that was Zambia Mozambique, Angola, all the, all the countries that had, had gained independence, um, Tanzania, and they were on the front line, as they called it, of the fight against apartheid and white-dominated um, regimes, yeah. Mm, gosh. And I suppose we better get to, to your story, Chris. Um, when you were called up, did you say 70? Six. 76. So that's yeah. right, sort of right in the thick of it. Yeah. Did, what was the sort of feeling then? Are people called up? Were they, did, were they patriotic? Did they want to go and fight? Or were they thinking, oh my God, this, this could turn bad? I, I think it was a, a, a combination of all sorts. Um, I mean, you know, we were 18, so, I mean, we were pretty well naive, you know, we, we didn't really know what was going on. I personally um, had, a, I knew it was bad. I, I knew that things were, were, were going to turn bad and that um, so long as Smith and Mugabe were the main protagonists, there was never going to be any kind of settlement. Um, so there was no end in sight as as far as I could see. I was totally anti-Smith um, and his Rhodesian front. I, I saw them as um, ultra right-wing um, dinosaurs. They, they, they just didn't see the, the, that black majority rule was inevitable um, and negotiate around that, which they could have done. And um, I mean, the terms that Harold Wilson offered in 1966 were pretty generous. Um, it was like a 15-year transition, as I've mentioned. Um, as it turned out, it ended up as a 15-year conflict mm. um, with the same result or worse result because Mugabe came in. Um, yeah, so, I mean, although I, I, 
politically, I was pretty naive. I, I, I did it because it was my duty. You know, I got called up. Yeah, not happy happy about it, but I did it. Yeah. yeah. And what what sort of just to give us an idea? And obviously, this percentage would change as the as the rebels grew. But what sort of percentage of people of black people, black Africans around you? were rising up to join this rebel movement? Probably a very small percentage, but um, in, in, in classic sort of communist guerrilla style, um, the, way they, uh, the way they recruited was uh, forced recruitment. They would, they would um, go in and, and take a whole school of several hundred kids um, um, abduct them and take them across the border into um, the base camps in Zambia and Mozambique. Um, that, that was one way, um, forced conscription, basically. Um, but there were a lot of volunteers um, in, 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 the, in the black areas. So it was a little bit of an anomaly for them because the Rhodesian security forces were predominantly black. Um, for example, I mean, you'll know the Salu Scouts um, who, who st started sort of 75, 76. Um, I, they were the largest regiment in, in the Rhodesian army. Um, they had about two, they had a strength of about 2,000. Of that, about 16, I might be wrong, but about 16, 1,700 of those 2,000 were black. Um, they, they were they were professionals. They were doing it for a job. Um, you know, they were being paid. There were two black infantry regiments who were excellent, the Rhodesian African Rifles, and they had, I mean, their history went back to uh, the Great War. They fought in World War II um, in Burma, um, and they, they fought in Malaya. I mean, they, they had a fine history. They were, they were the largest um, infantry regiment in the country, and then, um, then there was the Rhodesian Light Infantry, my crowd, um, which was a small regiment, whites only. Um, there, there was the SAS, um, C Squadron SAS were there. Um, again, whites only, um, very small. Um, I don't think their strength ever got to more than a couple of hundred. Um, and then the bulk of the security forces were what we call territorials, essentially reservists. Mm. So what had happened, the whites would go in or, and do their national service and then they became eligible for um, uh, re re reserve service, territorial. They joined the territorial army, which had 10 regiments, um, varying sizes, and the regiments were all based uh, in an area. So, for example, um, the 1st Battalion was in Salisbury, 10th Battalion was in Guelo, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> often they were commanded by regular troops, the, 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 the territorials, but they were essentially civilians um, being forced into sort of call-ups. They would do, I mean, by the end of the war, they were, or later on in the war, they were doing six weeks in and six weeks out, as they called it. So... They would do six weeks service and then six weeks in civilian life working. It just was not workable. Um, and that started a fairly large exodus of whites from the country from 76 onwards. Yeah. And was there a was there a sort of fear that the black regiments or the the, the, the black African soldiers would turn? There was, yeah, there was, I don't think there was a fear, but uh, there was an awareness, not with um, so much the the RAR, the Rhodesian African Rifles, the infantry regiments, but more were in the Salu Scouts um, because most, uh, uh, well, not most, but a lot of the black operators in the Salu Scouts were turned, turned guerrillas, turned turs, TTs, as they were called, um, who, who had been captured and persuaded to change sides. Um, Generally, there, there were the odd occasions where a, a Salu scout operation was compromised and the former TTs in the patrol turned on there and shot everyone on, on, on the patrol, but that was rare. Um, yeah, it, it did happen, but not very much. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it was the, how, how do I pronounce it, Silus? 
Salut. Salut. Yeah, French name. Original. Salut, yeah. Salut. Ah, I see. Silent S. Salut. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was the Salou Scouts that, that put me in contact with you. I mean, not not literally, obviously, but um, because the the new Ranger Regiment in the British Army has a very similar cat badge. And it's 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 caused some. Control, yeah, bit of the, the, it's like a, it's an Osprey. Yeah, they um, the, the 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 range our rangers it's a uh, peregrine falcon yeah but yeah based but, on the uh, based on the was it was the osprey the original was it yeah yeah, yeah. no I, I saw there was some a little bit of nonsense about that quite recently yeah yeah it's well there's a lot of nonsense with our forces anyway chris because what what they're hiding from everyone is it's it's all about a european army now yeah um, with the aim of protecting commerce between Europe and China. Um, and all the military, it's quite funny, really, all the military is just going along with it. They have no idea that, that you know, what <laughs> what their future role. Um, they're all a bit naive to it, I could say. I think we're, yeah. we're, they're still sort of flag waving and it's we're long past sort of nation states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, I just want to uh, ask you. So, you you've been called up. What what sort of training does that involve? And would you say that your uh, your colleagues, so your fellow soldiers, are they? Do they come from like a good crop to make soldiers? I mean, are they are they bushmen? Are they are they? I don't know. Maybe ranchers. They're dealing with animals and stuff. So they're they're kind of like macho guys or 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 is it sort of take all sorts it was, it was all sorts but i mean i i, I would think because rhodesian society was, was um was very outdoor based um a, a lot of emphasis on sport and yeah so they're, they're, they were were a good crop i'd say uh, as as far as soldiers went or potential soldiers went um our training was um almost identical to British Army training. I think it was um, 21 weeks in total, um, of which the first six weeks is basic training, which I think the Yanks call boot camp. I think that's what it is, six weeks of basically fitness. And at the end of six weeks, you supposedly had a choice of which branch um, you'd like to go into of, of the service. I mean... We, we lost a few guys, went into medics or armoured cars or not many, but 99%. Um, we had no choice, really. We stayed on as infantry. And then the second six-week or seven-week period of training was what we call the classical warfare stage, um, which was as it sounded. Um, and then the third uh, stage of our training was... Um, Counterinsurgency, the counterinsurgency phase, but uh, which was seven weeks, and that took you up to to when you passed out, to when you qualified, and we moved into um, the commandos of of the battalion. Uh, <clears throat> but you are very much British based. Everything was British based. Mm. I mean, identical almost. The same bayonet training with all three or three rifles, um, exactly the same. Um, a lot, a, a lot of our instructors. Were, um, had had done staff courses at Camberley and in the UK. And um, I mean, for example, the OC of our training troop, as we called it, was a guy called Captain Cooper, who was a guardsman. Um, yeah, so yeah, they, they came from all walks, but a lot of, of, of British um, instructors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you been yeah. to the Commando Memorial? Sorry? Have you been to the Commando Memorial? Not, not in the uk i mean i obviously saw it um uh, when it was in rhodesia and um i i was um i was instrumental on uh, I, I had quite a lot to do with getting it to where it is now i was on the um rhodesian light and free regimental association i was there on that body for quite a long time so mm -hmm. uh, i was fairly instrumental in getting it um set up where it is now 
So, where, Chris, when you're train when you're doing your training, are, are you getting sort of let's just call them horror stories or action stories from the front? Yeah, all the time. Um, bear in mind that it was sort of January, February '76, and and the main infiltrations were starting then, but they hadn't really had time to take effect. Um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 we had stories from what we called the old soldiers, the veterans who'd been around, and a lot of our instructors were um, veterans themselves who'd, 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 uh, who'd, who'd, who'd seen action. Um, it was, was as, as uh, time progressed through our training, we started appreciating that um, this was actually starting to get a little bit serious and that there were some fairly large infiltrations. Um, I mean, when we, when we passed out in May 76, I think the, the total strength, the uh, guerrilla strength in Operation Thrasher, the Rhodesians had this funny system where they divided areas and called them operations. So uh, Operation Hurricane, which opened in 72 with that um, infiltration prior to the Portuguese pulling out. Uh, that covered the northeast of the country. Op Thrasher was the whole uh, eastern border down to Op Repulse, Repulse, which was the south eastern corner of the country. So, uh, And then you had various operations covering Botswana, the center of the country. They even had Op um, Operation Salisbury by the, you know, by the time the, the, the oil depot got taken out. So... Um, <clears throat> At the time when we passed out in 70, uh, May 76, there were, it was estimated that there were about, in Op Thrasher, the one operational area, that there were probably about a 1,000 guerrillas resident in Op Thrasher um, with more and more infiltrating all the time. So the way the guerrillas would work, they would get, uh, get, get set up in uh, camps within the country um, with a gang of perhaps 40 to 50 guerrillas running an area, smallish area, and they would then facilitate further infiltration of guerrillas through their area to carry on into the sort of the centre of the country. And it, it, it was a massive operation for them. It, it, um, you know, it was ongoing all the time and growing all the time exponentially. So that by 78, 79, there were certainly maybe 10,000. I, I don't know. I don't think they ever had the numbers, but guerrillas. So, you know, it grew rapidly from 1,000 up to multiples of within a short space of time. And this was being replicated all across the country as well. And then you had um, Zapu in Coma, the, the, the Zambian-based um, um, Soviet-supplied crowd. They were more of a, um, although they had guerrillas in the country, they were only there primarily to counter Zanla guerrillas. They didn't want Zanla guerrillas getting into their heartland of Bulawa, which was the Matabili who were effect effectively uh, Zulu um, area of the country. They were predominantly classically trained um, um, by, by the Soviets. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they had tanks, uh, the, you know, they had um, the, the whole trip. They, they were a, a proper army. Um, and the plan was that uh, when Rhodesia started collapsing, they were going to invade but the problem was there was only one place through which to invade, and that was across the Victoria Falls Bridge. Um, to get an army across there was slightly pro problematic, but that never really happened until after independence. Um, and when you had a full-on civil war between Zanla and Zipra. Yeah. Um, Gosh. Yeah, and Zipra, I mean, that's the irony of the whole thing, was effectively um, their, all the armoured columns um, were taken out by what had been the Rhodesian Air Force. So, uh, so all the pilots were all Rhodesian Air Force pilots um, fighting for Mugabe now. Taking, oh, I mean, you know, it was a mess. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how, how were they getting supplied with ammunition and, and food? What, in the country? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm guessing that they would ransack 
farms and stuff and, and steal what whatever they wanted. Yeah. But yeah. also that, that wouldn't last too long, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, there, there was supply, um, food and by the locals, the local population, the, the, the mass of um, the masses, basically, as they were called, the peasants in, in the country, in the countryside. Um, am, ammunition, arms and ammunition were all cached. They had some fairly um, substantial arms caches in the country, yeah, which we came across now and again. Um, or if you captured one of them of, of some importance, they would, you know, show you where they were. Uh, yeah, that's, that's how it worked, yeah. And how were the Soviets getting the arms into the... Were, were they coming in by ship? Yeah, ship, aircraft, anyway. Um, I mean, totally porous. Uh, it was a b bit of a bizarre situation because, I mean, the British um, were in Zambia. Um, and, I mean, uh, the British Air Force, uh, the Royal Air Force, they were training the... Um, the, the Zambian Air Force. Um, so they were working uh, probably alongside the Soviets um, in, in training the, the, the Zambians. Um, I mean, it got to, in 66, or just after UDI, um, Wilson deployed the parachute regiment uh, into Zambia um, with talk of a, a British, um, British Army invasion of, of Rhodesia, which would have been uh, uh, horrendous. I mean, you know, there we are, our kith and kin, as they they like to call us. But that never never came to fruition. Fortunately, um, didn't need to. I mean, sanctions were killing Rhodesia. Yeah, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. And let's talk about your equipment because even when I joined up, it which was eighty eight, the kit we had then, it, it, we were on the cusp of a sort of like a bit of a tsunami of technology came yeah. in because you yeah. got things like Gore-Tex and, and walking boots that were just r r really well thought out and high tech rather than the old, um, what was it? We, we the, the plastic sole boots. So I can't remember yeah. what they were, DMS or something di direct molded sole. I think they called them. Yeah. Um, but we still, all our webbing and stuff was from the Second World War. We slept under a poncho, not, not, you didn't have such things as bivy bags and, yeah. Um, cooker, we cooked with hexamine, whereas now you'd have, well, not, not always, but you, you have rations that heat, heat themselves and this kind of stuff. So, how, how was it, how was your equipment and where, where was it, um, getting commissioned from? Same, same as like you in the early days. Um, it was totally, a lot of it, um, um, ex-Second uh, World War stuff. Um, I mean, our, uh, all our webbing was Second World War stuff. The Rhodesians try to make, copy it and make their own, which was rubbish. I mean, it was really rubbish. I mean, so much so that we, we had to plunder um, guerrilla webbing, um, uh, which we did. And... Um, but, you know, uh, for example, a, a lot of the territorial regiments still use the old Bren gun. Um, we use British mortars, um, uh, British landmines, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we moved on to the, what you guys call the SLR, we called the FN mm. um, in, the, in, the, in the late 60s. We, we managed to get a few thousand FNs into the country and the um, MAG, which you guys call the GPMG. Mm. Yeah, same, same thing, yeah. Um, so those, those were our principal weapons, um, FN and MAG, um, plus various mortars and rifle grenades and grenades and et cetera, yeah. But our, our actual kit was, was re the Rhodesian issued kit was absolute rubbish fell apart, rotted easily, it frayed, it was not strong enough. Um, so we essentially kind of made our own um, out of what we could scrounge. Um, it, for example, all, all my kit was either, uh, my webbing was either East German or Chinese. <clears throat> um, I mean, I even had a Russia, a Soviet hat that I wore and painted Rhodesian camouflage. Um, 
And then what, what really took off and which developed into what became, I think like you guys call a, a combat jacket. Um, I never liked that idea, but a lot of guys did. It started off with um, captured um, uh, chess magazines from, from communist chess magazines, um, which guys took over and adapted to fit an FN magazine. Um, and then from there, the, that, that developed into like a jacket, like a combat jacket where you had all your pouches and magazines and things like that. Um, I, I never went for that. I just had the standard webbing with a, a yoke and pouches and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. And did you struggle at all in this training? Was it, was it, I mean, you, you went on to become a commando. Can you explain the sort of transition there? Well, yeah, you know, that whole thing about, uh, I mean, the RLI was originally formed as a conventional infantry battalion with ABC companies and a support. Um, it wasn't a company, it was support group, you know, a standard uh, British company, uh, company structure. Um, they, they changed that and it became, uh, in the late 70s, it became, uh, they changed all the companies, became commandos, and um, uh, the, it became a commando battalion. But to me, I mean, I never re and support group became a commando in its own right. So it became, we had the commandos change from A, B, and C to one, two, three commando and support commando. Um, but I never really quite understood what the difference was between the commando battalion and a um, and an ordinary infantry battalion. When, when it's commando, I mean, we we all eventually became um, parachute trained. It became a large part of our operations was um, para um, but we didn't do anything special in terms of training uh, we got specialist training obviously um, later on but um, from passing out from our recruits course into the commandos it was nothing particularly difficult I mean I say difficult different from what ordinary infantry troops did mm. yeah so and I still don't get it why we were so, so called commandos, other than it sounds cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's another French word, isn't it, commando? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but we were always told it meant see without being seen, kill without being killed. <laughs> I've no idea. I've no doubt that's a load of horseshit. But <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <laughs> actually um, a commando is, w w was actually... Um, from the is Afrikaans. It's uh, from the the Boer War. Uh, yeah. You know the Boers were all arranged in commandos. So the old term when you went on commando, you got dragged out of your farm with your own horse, your own rifle, and sent on commando to go and trouble the Brits. Yeah, they were tough old boys, weren't they? <laughs> they were. Yeah. Yeah, my God. I mean, funny enough. Um, the majority, we, we always, the Rhodesian Light Infantry always had a problem with recruitment, which is why they opened up to national service in 1974, I think. Um, but initially, 90% of the Rhodesian Light Infantry were made up of South Africans um, who were who had come up to do three or five year contracts, earn some money, um, and then go back. And at the same time, um, the South African numbers in the battalion sort of slowly diminished as the own South African war um, escalated in, in Namibia, as it became, and Angola. Um, I mean, that was, that was a proper war, not like our little war. I mean, you're talking there of um, some 50,000 Cubans uh, fighting for the Angolans. And I mean, the Battle of um, Quito Canavali in, in southern Angola was <clears throat> been the largest tank battle in Africa since El Alamein. Um, it was massive. Um, South African tanks against um, Soviet, uh, what were they, were they 56, T-56? I can't remember what they were, but yeah, it was huge. And um, Cubans were flying um, Angolan Air Force planes. Um, South Africans are flying Mirages. Yeah, it was, it was a full-on conventional war taking place there. 
we didn't even know about it. We, we, you know, we, we were so bogged down in our little insurgency that this stuff was going on <laughs> in Angola. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, it's funny. I was on a train once to, I think I was on a train to Moscow and it was a night train and the guy came in, the, the other guy that would be sleeping in my carriage and uh, he was Russian and he said to me, do you, do you speak Russian? And I said, no, no, no. I said, do you speak English? He said, no, no, no. And then we looked at each other and he went, Portuguese? Sing. <laughs> and and because we'd both worked in Mozambique. We, so really? We spoke, yeah. Yeah. We, we spoke Portuguese for the... Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Quite, yeah. Quite funny. Yeah. So can you tell us some war stories then? Um I mean, it just sounds like you're in the thick of it. You, you, th this is this is all very real suddenly, and 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 then we'll come on to how did it all end. Yeah, well, yeah. As I say, May um, passed out in May '76 and was immediately dispatched. Um, the commander was on what they call fire force operations, um, which was a sort of development or tactic that the Rhodesians supposedly had developed was very simple. I mean, it, it, it was a, like a quick reaction force based out of a jock um, and they had various jocks around the country um, in the operational areas. So Operation Hurricane, the jock was based at Mount Darwin, which was the main operational center. Um, and there was an airfield there and the fire force three commander at the time we went up there in May, June 76, was based at the airfield. Um, we had a, a the fire force operation, which was really a vertical envelopment of the enemy. So um, that was our first uh, our first posting. We did six, a bush trip, as they called it, was, was six weeks in an area. Uh, you then go, go back to Salisbury for R&R &R for 10 days and then, six weeks later, for the next six weeks, you get posted to another another area. Um, so we were operating out of Jock Mount Darwin, um, which was a fire force operation. At the time, there were what we call G-cars, which are three alouettes, um, troop-carrying alouettes, all armed with twin Brownings. Um, and then the K-car, which was the command alouette, and had a 20-mile Hispana cannon. And that the... the um, the command of the Air Force aspect of the operation flew that chopper and the commander OC directed the battle in that chopper. So that would happen. There'd be a, a sighting, for example, or a call out, um, generally initiated by the Sulu Scouts, <clears throat> who were operating clandestinely in the area, and they would give us a good reference and they'd call, call, call in fire force. And we'd jump in the helicopters and um, go racing off. We had in support, we had um, what we called a Lynx, which was a Ream Cessna, which was a ground attack aircraft armed with um, napalm, snib rockets, and phosphorus. Um, he would go in first with, with his weapons, n n probably um, napalm, and hit the guerrillas. Um, and then the helicopters would come in and try and surround the, the guerrillas. It was quite difficult with only three helicopters, and each helicopter only took four troops. So in the first wave, as they call it, there were only like 12 troops um, trying to surround, sometimes 50 guerrillas or 100 or, or whatever. But obviously we had um, uh, air support, um, and, and the, the, the KCAR on the 20 mil they did a ser serious amount of damage. Um, and we would then sweep through the area and, and contact the guerrillas and hopefully kill them. And, and that was it. Um, and then get uplifted, go back to base, um, Mount Darwin, and wait for the next call out, um, which was by that stage happening on a pretty well a daily basis. So every day you knew if you were on first wave in the fire force, you, you were in the choppers and you knew that you would effectively be called out sometime in the day. You know? um, <clears throat> so you just sort of hung around and just waited until you heard the siren and then away you went. 
Um, as the war intensified and the guerrillas uh, were becoming more and more, um, were saturating the country more and more, um, there, were, there were so many call-outs that the fire force actually couldn't keep up uh, with, with the number of call-outs that were taking place. So they would have to prioritise, you know, which was important or which was the, 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 the particular call-out that um, we would be more successful with. And the others would just have to ignore, you know. So um, it was obviously very frustrating for the ground troops who had um, contacted the guerrillas or, or found them because the guerrilla tactics was not to confront um, the security forces. It was to mix with the masses like the fish, as our Chairman Ma said. And <clears throat> But when they were cornered, they put up a pretty good fight, um, generally. Um, I mean, the... the, the the first tactic when, was when the fire force arrived and they could hear these helicopters buzzing overhead was to bombshell, basically to flee um, and to hook up later. And they were quite good at that. It became a, a, uh, they were trained in how to do that. Um, when you heard a helicopter arriving, what do you, what's your sort of instant action drill? And um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, but often they were boxed in enough that um, they had to stay and fight and, you know, they, they fought well. I mean, they, they shot down a few choppers. Um, we took casualties. And in our first six weeks bush trip, um, all us sort of greenhorns, all our recruits who thought we were now heavy commandos, uh, we, we, you know, uh, we took a lot of casualties through um, an experience. Um, in that first six weeks. When I say a lot, I mean, we probably had uh, about 10 of us out of uh, 50 recruits who'd passed out into three commander were casualties in that first bush trip. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> not all dead, but there, there were a couple of deaths, but um, many wounded. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the, the old soldiers, as I called them, the veterans who'd been there, Bless you. They took out a lot, to, you know, they took casualties as well. It, it was simply the volume of, of guerrillas coming into the country. Um, so much so that, you know, they soon worked out that sending in three helicopters of four troops each, 12 men, to, to, to deal with um, 50 to 100 guerrillas at a time just wasn't working. And um, we were taking casualties and... Um, the guerrillas were basically escaping or fighting back. And um, so they, there weren't enough helicopters in the country. I think the Rhodesian Air Force probably had a total at any one time of 30 Alouettes, of which quite a lot of them were South African Air Force on loan with South African Air Force helicopters. Um, so they resorted to, I'd been there six months when they said, no, we're going to make the RLI my battalion, we're going to make you all, we're going to train you all up as para, paratroopers. <clears throat> so I started doing that. And I was on the second para course in January 77 um, in New Serum, which was the Air Force base, the main Air Force base in, in Salisbury. We went and did our para course, but they couldn't keep up um, with the volume of troops because at the same time, um, the Rhodesian African Rifles and the Salu Scouts were also all becoming para-qualified. So the South Africans stepped in with their Air Force down in, in Bloemfontein in South Africa, and they started training a lot of our guys up as well. So, And we were trained exactly the same um, training as with the, the British Army. In fact, most of our instructors were, were either British, a couple of Aussies, a Yank or two, you know, so... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we were trained, um, and then we became, so the fire force now could supply a fire force. When I say a fire force, there were probably three or four fire forces in operation at any one time in the country. Um, not all operated by RLI, mostly. A couple operated by the Rhodesian African Rifles. One even operated occasionally by the SAS, but the, their role was more external. Um, in Mozambique and Zambia. And um, so they upped the fire force strength from 
three helicopters to three helicopters and a Dakota DC-3 converted, um, which could take 16 to 20 paras at a time. So what had happened is the fire force would not take off the three helicopters and the three G cars and the, and the, and the K car. They'd go tootling off to the contact area with the links hovering around and then standing off because the, the, the Dakota is a lot faster than the helicopters. Um, out of earshot or out of range would be the Dakota. So the fire force commander would drop his troops in the G cars. Those helicopters incidentally would go back and try and pick up a second wave of troops if they could. Mm -hmm. um, and then depending on how the um, contact developed, he would then utilize his paras. And they would essentially, he would drop 16 to 20 troops. They would become the sweep line through the area. And, and the, um, the helicopter troops would become the stop groups. Yeah, so that's how it worked. So, I mean, straight away, they almost, they more than doubled the fire force capacity by using Dakotas. And <clears throat> so, I mean, I had my first operational jump, I think was in, I barely qualified, I got my wings, and on my first operational jump was a week later in February, 77. And yeah, so it, it was, um, I mean, jumping in those conditions was, it was fairly primitive and, and um, you know, we jumped from never, never higher than 500 feet operationally, sometimes 400 feet or lower. Um, so you, you didn't have a reserve then? Yeah, we did. We all had reserves, but, you you know, at that height, you don't have time to, to use it. So there were casualties. I mean, at one, um, one jump with the RAR, I think it was recorded at about 300 feet. Um, there was a death and there were half the stick were out with broken bones and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so it was pretty primitive. And the, obviously the, 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 they try to find a reasonable drop zone, but not always easy. And the fields, you know, those rural fields in, in the countryside were small. You know, they're all hand plowed and things like that. So there, there was no nice... DZ. Mm -hmm. So invariably it was into trees on rocks, you know, whatever. So we always sustained casualties in the jump. Um, always one or two out of 16 had broken ankle or broken something, um, which was a fairly high attrition rate because, you know, we were meant to be 120 people in a government training troops and commander, but inevitably, you know, invariably with, with casualties and people on training courses and things like that. We really had more than 70 or 80 troops at any one time in, in on operations in the commander. Um, so that's why you were, you were on um, call out pretty well all the time. Um, and I mean, you know, there've been war stories about, you know, some RLR guys jumping into three contacts in a day. Um, that was rare, but it did happen. Two contacts in a day, however, was more contact. It was more common. So, I mean, I, I, th I think I think that the world record of the number of operational jumps is held by a Rhodesian, a guy from one commando, same same um, training course as me. And I'm thinking it, um, he had something like 78, 79 operational jumps to his name. Um, so... <laughs> It, it was just uh, intense the, the whole time. Um, yeah, so when you're on fire force duties, as the war intensified, um, so did the contacts and um, and the number of operational jumps you did. Yeah. Gosh, uh, all the all our paras listening will be getting envious because, of course, they haven't really jumped since the Second World War, I believe, into combat. Apologies, friends, if there's the odd one that I'm missing. No no disrespect meant, but I've had this conversation on the podcast a couple of times about... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny enough, we had a lot of Brit Paras um, in, in Three Commando. And in fact, Three Commando, my, my company or commando, um, was called uh, the Foreigner's Commando. A um, lot of Brits. Um, in fact, we had more more foreigners than Rhodesians, uh, always. 
always the case. In fact, in my troop, which was a platoon, at one stage, I was the only Rhodesian in that platoon. The rest were Brits, Irish, New Zealanders, Aussies, Americans, Canadians, you name it, South Africans, we had all of them. And at one stage, I think the CO counted 18 different nationalities in the battalion. Yeah. Yeah. Were there any sort of um, mercenary outfits in this conflict? No, no. Um, the Americans particularly considered themselves mercs. <laughs> But they weren't. They were just foreign volunteers and they were paid exactly the same rates of pay as the Rhodesians. Um, I, I guess technically, I suppose they, they could be considered mercenaries, but they were just foreigners fighting. I mean, the Rhodesians actively um, recruited um, overseas, America, UK, that sort of thing. Yeah. But Did no, you... they, weren't, they weren't mercenaries per se. It can't have been pleasant ju jumping into conflict. And I mean, that makes you vulnerable enough, especially if you're in small sticks and you don't know how many enemy you're in, in the midst you're landing. But then, of course, if you break an ankle, you're that's frightening. I mean, you could you could just be overrun immediately. Yeah, um, that was more of a. Uh a worry um, in the external camp attacks. That's when you, when the, the RLI and the Seleucids or the SAS with the Rhodesian Air Force attacked the big base camps in Mozambique or Zambia, which became um, pretty well the, the, the standard MO of the Rhodesians in, from about 1978 onwards. Um, the first major camp attack was in 1976, which, which was done by the Salus Scouts, um, who took out probably about 2,000 uh, Zanla recruits, mainly, um, um, in a place called Nyadzonia. Um, uh, that, and, and that sort of set the template for uh, foreign raids uh, or external raids, um, preemptive strikes, as we call them, against enemy camps into... Um, Mozambique and Zambia, uh, and the, the, the next biggest one was in um, November 77, which was um, Op Dingo, which was the raid on Chimoya in Mozambique when I was actually on leave at the time, so I missed it, but it was 184 troops, Rhodesian troops, plus the Rhodesian Air Force attacked a camp of about seven to eight thousand um the 184 troops were made up of um uh three commando two commando and sas um, the whole raid was um led by the sas um and the and of that um a large contingent of that was para um so they would use um, scrimp and scrap every single Dakota in the country they could um, to, to get these paras into a raid. So what would happen is the paras would um, close off perhaps two sides of a box. The, the, the helicopter-borne troops would close up the third side and the um, Air Force with the um, gunships would try and cover the fourth side of the box. And that's how they did it, yeah. And then the paras would advance. Obviously, what happened was we have paras advancing on one side, paras advancing on the next side, and you got friendly fire taking place. So quite a lot, there were quite a lot of friendly fire incidents in those raids. But yes, that was always a problem when <laughs> on those external raids when you if you had an injury. Um, I mean, I remember my last op jump was in October 78 when we attacked a camp in Zambia, um, uh, it, it coincided with three major raids, one on Lusaka, one the SAS did on a camp no in the north of Zambia called Makushi, and the RLI, the whole battalion attacked a camp in the south of Zambia called 
CGT2, which was Communist Guerrilla Training Camp number two, um, of which there were about probably about five or six thousand guerrillas in residence. Um, a lot of them were, were unarmed um, recruits, um, but a lot of them were armed, and they they were they were the camps were well protected with bunkers, um, anti-aircraft emplacements, um, all 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 all, all um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> all sort of done by the the, the Soviets, the Soviet advisors. Um, so yeah, if if you had a problem then in, in on an op jump, it it could be a problem in that. A lot of the guerrillas might be fleeing your way, and uh, you know it did happen. But generally, we were lucky; it didn't happen too often. Mm. Yeah. Are you able to give us an idea of your sort of bloodiest contact? I'm, I'm just trying to picture a young man, you know, in in the heart of Africa, up against it, and I just would imagine it. It just all got a bit dark and frightening yeah i did um you know there's only so much of it you could do and uh by uh 78 uh, i mean during in the uh, middle 78 um i was i was i was 19 i think 77 uh, yeah i was 19 and by that stage because we'd suffered a fairly large sort of casualty rate um I mean, I, I was a lance corporal by then, but I was leading, I was running the whole, the whole platoon, the troop. Um, we, we had no sergeants. Um, the officers, there were no officers um, that had either been killed or wounded or there weren't enough coming through the system. Um, our senior NCOs were all wounded. Um, we, we took a lot of casualties at Chamoya in November 77. Uh, <clears throat> so I find myself as a 19-year-old lance jack leading a troop um, which was quite interesting, but a, a fantastic experience in terms of leadership. But it was 78 and early 79 that were, were what I call my dark, dark days when it was just um, absolutely intense, the, the number of call-outs and contacts you were having. And they all tended to just to blur into the next. Um, but probably... The, the the one contact I remember was um, was in, in January 79. I had about a month or less before my three years was up and I demobbed. Um, <clears throat> and I, um, I decided that I would take over the MAG um, to let the, the, the younger guys coming or the, or the uh, t take over the uh, stick leader um, duties. So I became a, a, an MAG gunner and I carried the, the MAG in 77 when I was still a, a trooper um, and I liked it. I liked the MAG. Um, and our stick leader was an American. Um, the other two riflemen, one was a Rhodesian and one was also an American. And we landed at this kraal, which is a, a sort of rural village um, and it looked it looked reasonably prosperous there were good crops in the field um, and it was a big crawl and um, the the stick leader um, he'd become a sergeant he was a sergeant by then Hugh Hugh McCall um, he killed in action a few months later um, uh, and a guy called um, the American Bob Smith um, from Georgia um, they went, we dropped out, we, the, the helicopter um, uh, dropped us just outside the crawl. We debussed an uh, in plane, uh, sorry, got off the helicopters, went into our all ground defence. And, and the, the, the stick leader said, right, Chris, you and Kevin, the Rhodesian who was with me, you go around the left side of the crawl, they'll go around the right side of the crawl and see if we can flush anything out. Um, Kevin and I, well, the crawl was essentially two long lines of huts. And in the middle was a sort of communal area where they did their cooking and that sort of thing. And as we came into the, the sort of mouth of the two lines of huts, from about 40, 50 yards away, um, they opened up on us, me and Kevin. 
and uh, yeah, it was terrifying. Absolute. Well, at the time, I mean, you you, know, you knew you're being shot at, but um, it was like bees, was zing, 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 all around. And um, I thought th this can't be happening, and I was just waiting because I could feel them there and there. I mean, close. You you know when a a, a, a bullet's close to you, it's like wow, and. and um, and I thought, I've got to be hit. I'm going to be hit. And um, and I shot it at Kevin, who, who didn't know what was happening. He was sort of 10 meters to my left. And we, we always spread out a lot if we could. And um, we, we dived for cover behind this grain storage bin, which was um, a, a, a mud structure, a stick and mud, pollen daga, we call it, stick and mud structure on um, posts on on pillars, and the pillars were were um, tree tree trunks, but thin ones, like maybe six inches at the most, and that was our cover, um, groveling behind these um, these little posts um, in the dust, and and uh, it's a real war story. But the, the the ground was just being torn up. They're sort of following us, I, and I really don't know how we were hit, and <clears throat> then suddenly. I mean, it must have been within a minute, I guess, it all happened. The silent, absolute silence, not a thing. And they stopped, and I thought, they're probably running away. And um, sort of picking ourselves up, checked that the gun was all right, covered in dust and crap and things like that. And um, Hugh, the American, he's around the other side of the crawl. He doesn't know what's going on. So he's shouting, Chris, you okay? You okay? What's happening? Um, and then the K car knows that something's happening. So he starts pulling in overhead, but he's also confused, doesn't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then to the right of the crawl um, was a, which was common, was, was a mango tree, um, little plantation. So they grew their own mangoes and things like that. Um, uh, about 15, 20 trees, a little, a little orchard almost. And um, I suddenly see these four figures dashing through the so through the smoke and everything. I see these four figures trying to exit the crowd, running through this mango plantation. And um, I thought, that's them. Those are these these are the bastards who've been trying to shoot shoot me. So I actually got quite angry. And but I was sitting on my on my butt, and I had the MAG um, on its bipods between my legs. And I, there was no time to get into a proper firing position. You know, I couldn't get prone or I couldn't stand up and put the gun on my hip. There was no time. I, so I literally kind of um, gra grabbed, the, grabbed the trigger, put my, my left hand down on, on the butt of the MAG and fired. And I had a 100-round belt on the, the MAG then. I always had a 100-round belt, 50-round um, belts in all my pouches, and I had a couple of... 200 round bandoliers across my, my chest. <clears throat> and I saw these guys running and I gave a short burst to, to see if I could see a fall or shot or anything. And it was short. I could see because there were a lot of dry leaves in, in, in the manga um, plantation. I could see my strikes following them. So I slightly elevated the gun and let, let rip. Um, um, and all four of them went tumbling down, um, I think. I mean, it all happened so fast. But I know I got four of them. Um, and then McCall, Hugh McCall, came around and said, what's happening, what's happening? I said, no, I got him. I got four. There, near where you are. And, and yeah, bullshit, you didn't. Um, anyway, we, we got up and went and swept swept through the area. Um, we found two, two bodies dead. Um, and then we couldn't find the other two. And I said, I know I got four, Hugh. And they'd fallen um, into an ant bear hole, which is a fairly large hole. Um, and the one on the guy who was the, the guy who was on top was dead, but the one underneath wasn't. He was only wounded. And um, so we hauled the body out, and uh, then managed to get this other guy out who was wounded. Um, he was pulled out, and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> dare I say, I mean, uh, to, to, to our shame, um, um, the American shot him, mm. shot him in the back of the head. <clears throat> and um, we then went back to sweep through the crawl 
and blow me down. There were, there were still several of them hiding in various huts. Um, and, and it just became like a bloodbath in, in trying to get these, these guys out the huts because in the huts as well were all the civilians. Uh, that was just awful, absolutely awful. I mean, Bob Smith, the American, um, kicked up in one hut and was met with an AK kind of, almost, you know, blew, 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 almost blew him away from point blank. And so they, I'm now the MAG gunner. I don't have to get involved in all this hut clearing. I'm there to cover. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and the rest of the stick were just taking these guys out of the huts one by one, but just chucking in grenades and, and all sorts of things. And it was just, I looked in the one hut afterwards and it was just, just blood and, and bodies. And it was just, just too awful. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, we finished with the village. We cleared the village, cleared all the huts. Um, and then when, meanwhile, the, the K car has said, no, they've, they've gapped it, which they've run away into the river line, which they always did because that was the, the heaviest cover, the bush in, by the river. Um, so we went and we started sweeping along one side of the river, the four of us, hooked up with another stick who were on the other side of the river. They, they were sweeping. So we were eight, eight of us um, sweeping and we got another two. Um, all sort of point blank, and I st stuck my stuck the gun in the shoulder because you fired up now, and um, y y your adrenaline is just pumping. And yeah, you know, so we blew them away from kind of point blank range. So we we got a, a fairly high kill rate that day. But um, you know that that sticks in my my mind, especially as civilians in there. And um, at the end of the day, we were ordered to burn the crawl. Um, and there were these women and kids uh, just, just sitting there outside. You know, we, we just destroyed their, their homes, their lives. Half of them are dead inside the, the huts. And um, we got on the helicopters and went home. We got drunk, you know. That, that's how it worked. Uh, just, just too awful, too mm -hmm. awful. And, and um, the, the civilians had no choice in the matter. Um, they had to um, supply the guerrillas. They had to provide um, succor, food, women, water. Um, otherwise, they were, they were executed. They were taken out. So they were in a, in a no-win situation. And then we came along. And, I mean, we just, you know, cross, caught in crossfire was a common thing on the sort of security forces communique every day on the radio. They said, you know, yesterday, 52 guerrillas killed. Uh, the Rhodesian were big into the body count thing. Um, uh, two Rhodesian security forces killed in action and 13 civilians killed in crossfire. It was a daily thing on, on the radio, you know. So, yeah, that was, that was, that was um, and then two days later after that, um, I'd been put onto dispatcher duties. I was also a assistant parachute dispatcher. So I'd stand in the, 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 the par in the DAC, Dakota, and, and throw the, the, the paras out. Um, and we, our troop that day suffered six casualties, I think two dead and four wounded. It was against a big group of like 60 um, near the eastern border. Um, and they were what we called hardcore. Um, they fought, they, they would fight to the end, especially the women guerrillas. Um, there were a lot of them. Um, not a lot, but, they, you know, there they, they were quite a few. And they were they were, they were were fairly hardcore. Um, yeah, so, and I remember that day when um, I was at Grand Reef, which was our fire force base, um, where the fire force took off from, and it had a proper um, tarmac um, runway, which could accommodate um, our jets, our Canberras, and all our antiquated Canberras, and Hawker hurricanes and vampires, even, um, <clears throat> and uh, a one of the G cars, the the the, the Alouette threes, was coming in with uh, casualties, our casualties, and I went to because I was also a trained medic, um, so I, I went to the, the runway to see if I could help, um, <clears throat> and there were, <clears throat> excuse me, three of our guys sitting on the back seat, the back bench of the Alouette three. Um, a body on the floor, 
Brad Little. He was a Brit. He'd been killed. And he had a little hole right through there. He was dead. Um, and the three sitting in the back, one had been shot through the guts um, and bayoneted of all things. Another Brit, a guy called Neil Hooley, um, and bayoneted in the leg by an AK bayonet. I mean, really, in that, you know, that's how close it <laughs> uh, And it was his third time of being wounded. So uh, he was moaning, uh, but he was okay. I mean, I could see he would live. The guy in the middle, um, uh, Ray Wilkins, he'd, he was a gunner. He'd been shot in the legs, but he would be all right. And the other guy, Mark Pullbeam on the other side, was sitting straight as a ramrod, and his whole head was bandaged like that. And he'd been shot, and AK round had gone, taking his eyes out. <clears throat> so he was blind. He would be, become blind um, to this day. And um, I'm in touch with him now and again, but what an amazing guy. I mean, his whole career, and, and he's been blind. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that was pretty horrendous. And I thought, no, things are getting <laughs> pretty serious here. And not only that, but um, they, they were still taking casualties back at the contact zone. And um, I don't know what the, the figures were that day, but um, Bob Smith, the American guy, he got shot in the guts um, that day. Um, went back to Georgia a few months later when he'd finished his three years um, in Georgia. And he was actually mowing his lawn, I mean, how's this for shit for luck, mowing his lawn and a, a massive 18-wheeler um, truck lost control, came hurtling around the bend into his garden and killed him, smashed him. I mean, bizarre. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah weird. And, um, yeah, so that, that kind of, I was scared by that time. Um, not, not scared, but I just had this awful, awful feeling that I knew that my time was coming and that if I did this for very much longer, it was just a matter of time before I got it. And, you know, I mean, to, to, to carry on from that war story when we killed eight or nine that day in, in that one crawl, when I got back to camp that night and I took off my webbing, I had um, probably about four or five rounds um, in my webbing either side. I mean... Um, one had gone through a water bottle, one had hit my spare radio battery, um, one had hit my um, first field dressing pouch, one had smashed a magazine, a, a, a belt um, of rounds. I didn't even know at the time. Um, and I just thought, no, you know, some up there is watching me. Um, but it, it got to the stage when I just knew that I couldn't do this for, forever, you know. No, here's a war story. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I just thank you, Chris, for being so candid. You know, we, we we live in a bit of a delusional world, don't we, with respect to our he he heroising war. And now, of course, the generation coming up, they, they've all played Call of Duty since they were, you know, maybe eight years old, and they think that this is all heroic and, you know, it won't happen to me. And, of course, it's... It's yeah. so bloody futile, you know? Yeah. Futile and, and so damaging to the individual. Yeah, yeah. On that yeah. point, has it given you trauma? Have you, have you had, you know, stuff to deal with? Or you, you, see, you seem very well adjusted. Yeah, I've, I've had my share of, of, of PTSD. Um, funny enough, years and years after the event, um, and they say that PTSD can strike up to like 30 years later. Um, yeah, I've, I've had, uh, had you know, normal stuff, but not very really nice. I've, I've, I've had a lot of counselling and sort of dealt with it. But um, it's always there, you know, lurking, lurking in the back of your mind. And, I mean, there are a few specific incidents that just haunt me, um, especially kids, you know. I've seen kids... Them taken out by napalm and that kind of stuff, you know, you're just tough to deal with. Um, but yeah, as I say, it is what it is, and and um, you've got you, you live with it, but um, you try not let it take over over your life. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, the past is the past. I, I don't even connect. I literally don't even connect with it in my brain. It's yeah it, uh, only because no good no good can come of living in the past you know well, exactly le learning lessons maybe but 
you sure. learn and, and, and move on. And we can all, we'd all get so weighed down if we analysed everything that we'd ever been involved yeah. in, wouldn't we, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, if you, you, you try and put it into, I mean, there's a, a, a massive disconnect between a civilian life what you've become and what happened then, you know, and um, stuff that I like to think good people doing bad things, you know, um, th th that's what it is. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm essentially a good person, um, I think. And um, I mean, some of the things I did or was forced to do, it's not, it's not me, um, but that's, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You you're probably in a different scenario to me slightly because you had to join up, you were conscripted. Whereas I did it voluntarily. I wanted to go and prove myself. And I I think I was probably sociopathic at that time in my life. As in you tell me to kill that person. Yeah, I'll, if that's gonna make me a man, I'll I'll kill yeah. that, you know, and that yeah, it was that black and white to me. And yeah, I back now and think. Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. I have a really different view on everything now. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I think it's the same in, in all, all conflicts that um, in any war that you read about, it's, it's the young men, um, to start with, they're all absolutely gung-ho to, 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 to join the army and, and go and see action. Um, and it's only after a while that that turns to not such a, a, a happy event, you know. Yeah. yeah. When, when did you leave Rhodesia? Or, or mm. I stayed on in Zimbabwe till for another 15, six, 16 years, 15 years after independence, um, till 1996. Um, and I could see then that the writing was on the wall. Um, that the, I mean, after independence, the place went through some a little bit of a boom. Um, Mugabe was pragmatic. Um, that changed as time went on, and by the mid nineties, you know, the, you could see that the writing was on the wall economically. And so I moved to South Africa, which had only recently had um, their first democratic elections when Mandela came to power. So they were going through their own kind of um, post-conflict agonizing. Um, and I was in South Africa for nearly 20 years, and I moved to UK in, 19, in, in 19, 2015. Mm. Yeah, I've been here since then. Gosh, it's, um, it's a far cry from the motherland, though, isn't it? It's Mother Africa. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's kind of in your blood, but... Um, you Do you know, like it, it here? I mean, uh, I, it, it, it's cold in... <laughs> it's cold in the UK. Yeah, it's not so much the weather. Okay, obviously, the, the rain you, you kind of gets you down this, when it rains all the time, but it's not so much the weather. And, in fact, I think back to the last place I was living in South Africa where... In summer, it was 40 degrees plus every day. Mm. And uh, I, I struggled with the heat as much as I do with the cold. And I think the cold is generally easier because you can generally get warm, whereas yeah, the heat, yeah. Yeah, you get struggle to keep cool. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, South Africa became... Um, like the Wild West, I mean, the, the crime there was just unbelievable, was still is. I mean, out of the South Africa, the most violent cities in the world, South Africa has six cities in the top 20, yeah. you know, from, from number three, which was Pretoria, through to number 16 or something. So, um, yeah, not. I mean, everyone in South Africa, black or white, knows somebody knows people who've been um, killed, um, hijackings, home invasions. I mean, I've had several friends killed, murdered. Um, yeah, it is a violent place. I mean, and yeah. 
Chris, how was it then for, I don't want to use the word die hard because it's not fair, but if, if you're, what I think what a lot of you know, our audience would be surprised to hear is that you have white Africans, <laughs> you know, this is, this is colonization for you. Yeah. So you, so you get a young boy who, you know, a, a, a boy who's grown up in Africa, he's, he's African. Yeah. In Mozambique, you really see this because you, when yeah. you meet, meet some of the old Portuguese that stayed after, after yeah. the, after the liberation. Uh, yeah. Um, they're they they're european but their yeah. mannerisms are all uh, are all african it's exactly it's very bizarre yeah but what i wanted to ask was i'm guessing there were people that they would not call it zimbabwe for for probably until they died yeah those those types generally all left they've gone um most went to australia um, some went to South Africa, but the real diehards um, are, are in Australia. Um, the actual um, white Zimbabweans who stayed on, I mean, they're fully integrated into Zimbabwean society. And my, I mean, my daughter and her family are still there. Um, you know, I've got lots of, um, of friends and, and family still in in Zimbabwe, um, and they're doing okay uh, uh, under some fairly tough conditions. But race is not an issue in Zimbabwe, um, and it hasn't been for 20 years or more, um, more, more, maybe 30 years. More, more so a case in South Africa, um, I think because of the, the history of the country. Um, and as you say, in the, the, colon the ex-colonies of Mozambique and Angola, not at all. Um, even during the war, it wasn't really so much as, of an issue. Um, the, the problem was with Mozambique, uh, as I say, um, was the, the exodus, overnight exodus of, of white Mozambicans slash Portuguese out of the country. It was so much so that there are half a million Mozambican Portuguese in South Africa, um, mainly all in jo jo uh, Johannesburg. Um, but you're right. I mean, the, the ones who've stayed in, in Mozambique are Mozambican first. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like you, um, I, I did a, spent a lot of time in um, Mozambique on business mainly uh, in the 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, as the war was sort of coming to an end. So, you know, I can identify exactly what, what you experienced there. But did yeah, ever, I mean, you know, beautiful country, but uh, did you ever Africa. go to Nicala, Nicala Porto? No, I never, no, I never went up that far. No. Yeah, that's where I was in a sm small village there. It was really incredible, incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, they still had beaches that were 20 miles long, as far as pristine. And yeah. there's not a single person yeah. on them. Yeah, absolutely no, amazing. No, no beach bars, no, 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 yeah. nothing. Just, just miles and miles yeah. of raw, yeah. raw yeah. ocean. It was absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah, Chris, let, let's let's promote you a bit because you do some speaking, and you you're a, yeah. a fairly prolific author, from what I can see. Uh or more prolific I've, I've, than I am, I think. <laughs> I've done a couple of books. Yeah, I've done um, my memoirs in a book called Fire Force. Um, and then there was a, um, a follow-up to that, which I called Survival Course, which is my the last year of the war when I wasn't in the RLI. Um, I was in what was called the Police Reserve. And then that covers the, the sort of adjustment or, or not to civilian life. Thereafter, yeah. So that was the, the, the follow up, and then I've done a, a CD novel set in Mozambique. I'm a send you a copy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, well, or I'll, I'll buy one certainly. I'll and tell you what. I, I, I'd I'd like to get a copy of your book. Absolutely. If you if you send me your address, we'll. Sort yeah. That. I don't know which one you want. Um, my, my my wife is an ultra runner, and um, so she wants that one. 
Oh, it's good you'll be said that, otherwise she'd have got one of my druggy books. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yeah>. my... <laughs> She'd be like, what? <laughs> no, I mean, my survivor course, the sequel to, to Fire Force, is uh, a lot of that. I mean, you know, so I can identify there what you, you went through. But Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll put all your links below, Chris, so anybody listening, I... I, I strongly encourage you to get Chris and come and speak for you because I this has just been an absolutely unbelievable chat. It's been so special, Chris. Thank you. Um, I just hope, well, I don't hope. I'm, I'm sure everybody watching will, will have appreciated it as much as I do. So thank you ever so much. No, thank you, Chris, and, and very nice. How did you find me, by the way? Um. I, I did a little video on the cat badge thing about the rangers and, and the scouts. It, it, okay. only a, it, 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 it's more because it ties into the new European army, which everyone's in denial about. And I, yeah. from a, not a political point, but from a, a way the world is going, I think people need to start waking up that we're losing everything, <laughs> even our, you know, we've, even our freedom now. And so Back to the video I did, um, I, I was kind of, you know, as you can tell, I've got a rudimentary idea of decolonization, which is way more advanced than most English blokes would even begin to. I mean, a lot of people I have no doubt in this country don't even know where Africa is. <laughs> is it on the east or is it on the on on the west? Yeah. In fact, for people that are going, yeah, yeah, I, I had a... A, a Swedish girlfriend for seven seven years. And the first time she came to England with me, I said, "Look, listen, just be prepared. When I introduce you to my friends, they're going to say to you, oh, Sweden, oh, chocolate and cuckoo clocks.' La 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 la." And she and she just looked at me as though, "What?" Because obviously Swedes think they're the epicenter of the planet, you know. Yeah. The, 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 and let's give them the credit; they're quite happening girls and guys up there. They, you know, they're on the leading edge of technology and fashion and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And and she just looked at me in disbelief. And then, of course, when I brought her here to Devon, so this is my friend so and so. I said, "This is my girlfriend. She's from um, Sweden." And then, oh. Cuckoo clocks, chocolate, and and um, yeah, and and it was an eye opener for that in England we really have no, uh, you know, we're, we're not as bad as our American brothers and sisters, no. but no. We're, we're pretty bad geographically. Um, <laughs> but going back to the, the video, so I said a couple of things in it, and I said the these Salu scouts would have been quite bad bastards, and um, and what I meant by that is they are facing a hardened enemy that don't muck around. There's not, you're not going to find Queensby rules in a bush, right? Yeah. This is what I was trying to say. And a couple of people picked up on it. And I also mentioned that I, I said that Rhodesia was under apartheid, but what I meant is it was under white, white rule is I, is probably what I was speaking for, which Technically, is a form of apartheid. Absolutely, uh, it's just a word. I mean, it was segregationist. Yeah. Yeah, apartheid's yeah. an Afrikaans word. Rhodesia was just the same. Maybe not quite as hardcore as the South Africans, but it was apartheid. Yes. Well, thank you for clearing up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel so guilty. Up, upset so many people now, but yes. Chris, just stay on the line so I can thank you properly, but massive thank you again to all our friends at home. Massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. Um, turn that bloody television off because none of it's true. And we'll create a better world where we don't have all this conflict. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.